Hello everyone. I've got the tech news of the week. I'm going to review a must-have Android app. I've got emails and I'm going to show you how to get started with your Raspberry Pi. All of that and more coming up next on We Talk Nerdy. We Talk Nerdy. WeTalkNerdy.tv is sponsored by UBU Enterprises, specializing in custom business website design, social media marketing, and online branding strategies for companies and products. Hello, and welcome to We Talk Nerdy. I'm your host, Dave Larson, and this is a show where we talk about tech news, reviews, and how-tos. It's been kind of a slow week in tech, and I think it's because everybody's at home watching Game of Thrones and playing Bioshock Infinite. I know I am. In case you somehow missed it, the third season of HBO's Game of Thrones premiered last week, and legions of fans tuned in, turned on, and started downloading. According to torrentfreak.com, millions of people are pirating Game of Thrones on BitTorrent. The popular show has had a million downloads in one day. That's never happened before, and so many people are sharing this file at the same time, it's over 160,000 simultaneous peers. That's a new record. Now, this might sound like a disaster for HBO, uh, but I would argue that that is actually not the case at all. By the way, HBO's president of programming, Michael Lombardo, agrees with me. He said recently, quote, I probably shouldn't be saying this, but it's a compliment of sorts. Demand, the demand is there, and it certainly didn't negatively impact the DVD sales. Piracy is something that comes along with having a wildly successful show on a subscription network, unquote. I think that's a very open-minded view. Now, I'm sure HBO would prefer that everyone would pay to watch Game of Thrones, but HBO overall is taking a fairly enlightened view towards all of this. Obviously, there are many more people who would like to see Game of Thrones than who actually have HBO, and I'm sure many Game of Thrones fans would be willing to pay something to watch, but given the fact that you have to sign up for a cable package uh, and then pay for HBO service on top of that, it's not really that surprising that so many people aren't willing to pay quite that much. Uh, HBO would be wise to offer their programming in a more a la carte friendly sort of fashion, but the reality is that they have contracts with cable carriers in the US that prevent them from doing just that. They do offer a streaming service called HBO Go, uh, but it's only available if you already are a HBO cable subscriber. And since HBO is contractually prevented from offering fans a more affordable option, it's really not surprising that many of them are turning to BitTorrent in order to download the show instead. Now, Game of Thrones director David Petrarca, I'm sorry if I messed that up, uh, he was recently quoted as saying that illegal downloads don't matter since shows like theirs thrive on cultural buzz. And he had to take to Twitter afterwards and backpedal a bit on those comments, but I do think he was actually absolutely right. The same fans that download Game of Thrones uh, on BitTorrent illegally uh, they're the same fans who buy the DVDs, the Blu-rays, and millions of dollars worth of Game of Thrones merchandise. Um, HBO, I don't think, is really very imp highly impacted by this illegal downloading. If anything, it just shows how great the show is and how popular it is. Um, I, I doubt that their bottom line is really being impacted very much at all. Uh, if anything, it shows that HBO would benefit from a different kind of model where they could distribute their uh, programming, uh, perhaps like the way Netflix does. Um, I don't see that changing anytime soon because of their contracts with the local carrier or with the uh, cable carriers, but who knows? Also last week, uh, as was widely reported, Facebook announced uh, Facebook Home. Uh, there have been rumors about the Facebook phone for months and months, and now we know for sure. Facebook Home is a home screen replacement for Android phones it, or, and uh, tablets, presumably. Um, it integrates a whole family of apps specifically optimized for Facebook. There's a new Facebook chat client called Chatheads, which allows you to chat with your friends via Facebook Messenger or via SMS. 
Facebook Home displays photos and stories from your news feed in a full screen effect on your device uh, with a slow sort of Ken Burnsian panning effect. Additionally, HTC announced that it would ship the HTC First with Facebook Home pre-installed. The HTC First is a mid-level Android phone which sells for $99. It has a 1.3 inch 720p display a 1.4 gigahertz dual core Qualcomm Snapdragon 400 processor, 16 gigabytes of storage, and one gig of memory. Now, you don't have to buy an HTC first, and of course, Facebook Home will be available for download from the Google Play Store on April 12th. However, it will only be available to those of you using Android 4.1 or better, and it doesn't work with tablets yet, but this is in supposedly in the works. Now, I hate to sound like the grumpy old man that I am, but there's absolutely nothing about this that I like. Uh, a number of tech point pundits have pointed out that, uh, HP, or that Facebook Home will allow Facebook to collect even more information about you. And in response, uh, Facebook published specifics about what they will and will not track. And to be fair, they're not really doing very much. But given Facebook's track record, I certainly wouldn't trust them. They have been more than willing to push the line uh, regarding privacy um, and then wait to see if users push back. Um, I don't trust Facebook with private information. And if you were to look at my Facebook page, you'd see that there really wasn't very much on it. To me, the worst part of this is that Facebook Home will deliver paid ads right to your home screen. Now, if you love Facebook and you can't go five minutes without checking your news feed, then maybe this is okay with you. Uh, but for me personally, I want absolutely nothing to do with it. Finally, this week I thought I would mention Bioshock Infinite. If you're not familiar with it, Bioshock Infinite is generating a huge amount of buzz among gamers. I've even heard numerous people suggesting that this is a very likely candidate for Game of the Year. Now, I know my friend Metalbeard will be rolling his eyes right about now, but this is a first-person shooter with a story, and I've only played the game a little bit, but I can tell you that it's really more story than shooter. Uh, the game is sort of slow-paced, and the story unfolds without a whole lot of traditionally what you'd call uh, first-person shooter combat. Now, I'm in a no-spoiler zone here. I'm not going to tell you anything about the game you don't uh, probably already know, if you know anything. Uh, but the game is set in uh, a floating city in the sky called Columbia, which looks every bit like Walt Disney's Main Street USA. Um, most of the reviews have been saying the same thing about this game. The story is great, the graphics are awesome, and I can confirm that it is. I loved the first Bioshock and honestly thought it was one of the best games I've ever played. Uh, I've only played the current Bioshock Infinite in a few minutes, um, really not very far into the story, but I'm looking forward to seeing how it unfolds. Uh, but if you are not a fan of uh, storytellers. If you want lots of monsters in your first-person shooter, you're probably not going to care much for Bioshock Infinite. It's really about story, atmosphere, and character. Now, this week I am going to review a free Android app called AirDroid. If you have an Android phone or an Android tablet, you need to stop what you're doing right now and go download AirDroid. It's just that good. So what is AirDroid? Well, quoting from the AirDroid website, it is, quote, a fast, free app that lets you wirelessly manage and control your Android devices from a web browser. It's designed specifically to, ver to, to bridge the gap between your Android device and your web browser on desktop computers, uh, Windows, I Mac iOS, or Linux. AirDroid requires Android version 2.1 or better, which is good because almost all Android phones and tablets at this point are Android 2.1 or better. Uh, you need a wireless network to run it, and I can show you how it works now. First, download and install the free Android app from the Google Play Store. Once you start up AirDroid on your device, 
you'll get a screen that shows you a URL to connect with and a randomly generated login code. You can also set a predefined password, but that's less secure and not really recommended. Point your browser to the URL on the screen and enter the code. You can also take a picture of the QR code to log in. Android has two connection modes, express and secure. The express mode is faster and the secure mode is, well, more secure, but also slower. The secure mode encrypts your network traffic, so use it if you're in a public place or concerned about somebody eavesdropping on your network. Once you're logged in, your browser is now communicating with your Android device. You can copy and paste files back and forth. If your device is rooted, you can also take screenshots. You can access apps, SMS messages, photos, videos, call logs, music, ringtones, and the list goes on and on. Now, let's suppose, for example, that you want to back up a picture from your Android device to your computer. Simply click on the photo icon to open your camera roll. And I have a couple of pictures here of my cats that I'd like to download. So all I have to do is select the photos I want to download, then click the download button. AirDroid puts the pictures into a zip file called photos downloaded from AirDroid. And the zip file is then downloaded automatically to your computer. If you like, you could select all the download, uh, all the pictures and uh, download everything in one big file. Um, but if you do that and your network is maybe a little bit slow, that could take a long time. Uh, AirDroid is incredibly powerful and totally free. Uh, I give it a perfect five out of five nerd points. Now, I'd like to talk to you briefly about our sponsor, UBU Enterprises. Do you need a website for your small business? Maybe you need help managing your business's social network media. UBU Enterprises can help you. They have helped me quite a bit. Uh, they took my ideas, added in their own flair for design. They helped me find and execute uh, a website that worked for me. They got me exactly where I needed to be and I couldn't have done it really without them. The best part is they're still working with me to make sure that my website runs smoothly and I can't recommend them highly enough. Visit them at ubuenterprises.com. I've got an email this week from Jared H. who says, I think I've got a virus on my computer. I could have the Geek Squad look at it, but I'd rather not go to all that trouble. Any suggestions? Yes, indeed. Uh, my number one go-to application for getting rid of malicious software is a program called Malware Anti-Malware, sorry, it's called Malware Bytes Anti-Malware. I know it's kind of a weird name, but it's a really good program. There's a free version available and you can download it from malwarebytes.org. Simply download, install, and run a scan. Uh, in my experience, it does a great job. I've since spoken to Jared about his virus problems and he reports that not only did Malware Bytes get rid of the virus he knew about, but it got rid of several others that he wasn't even aware of. Now, while Malwarebytes anti-malware software, that's quite a mouthful, uh, is great at getting rid of infections you currently have. Uh, they also have a pro version that helps you from getting infected in the first place. Uh, it's $24.95 and you can download it directly from their website. Uh, it's a good preventative measure uh, that you can take to keep the nasty software off your computer. And it's always good to support developers that you know and trust. As long as we're talking about security software, I'd like to mention two other software packages that I've always, I've, I recommend and I've found very useful. Uh, the first one is called SpyBot. It's SpyBot Search and Destroy from safernetworking.org. SpyBot has two modes of operation. There's a simple mode that anyone can use to just scan your computer for spyware and it'll automatically get rid of spyware and other malicious software. There's also an advanced mode you can use, uh, which lets you get under the hood a little bit more, and it can help you set up a hosts file uh, or manage your startup applications or um, manage uh, browser helper objects. Uh, those are typically used with Internet Explorer, uh, but if you're a good Chrome user, you don't really have to worry about those too much. 
SpyBot is free and it's a good addition to your anti-malware toolbox. Finally, I'd also recommend Komodo security software. You can download many of their products for free at www.komodo.com slash products slash free products.php. If you get a little overwhelmed by all the free software offerings, um, but just focus uh, until you're comfortable with it on the uh, anti software, uh, antivirus software and the uh, firewall software. I use uh, both of those on my laptop. Uh, I would say that the antivirus software is probably better at keeping you from getting infected than it is from removing an infection, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. If you don't get a virus in the first place, then you don't have to worry about removing it. If you, if you try Komodo antivirus, keep in mind that when you first install it, you have to train it, which means that every time you launch an application for the first time, Komodo antivirus will ask you if it's okay to run it. This can be annoying at first, uh, but it remembers your choices and as time goes by, you'll see that uh, these alerts from Komodo less and less. Also, Komodo antivirus occasionally pops up ads for other Komodo products. It doesn't happen very often and personally, it doesn't really bother me. They're offering me good software for free, so I can't really blame them for wanting to try to pay the bills. Thanks for the email, Jared. If you have a problem or a question that needs answers, you can email me at wetalknerdy.tv at gmail.com. I would love to hear from you. In last week's how-to, I gave you an introduction to the Raspberry Pi. I explained what it is, what you can do with it, and the kinds of accessories you're going to need if you want to make use of one yourself. I also, sh I also showed you how I hacked an old chocolate tin with a drill and a Dremel tool to make a simple case for my Pi. This week, I'd like to show you how you can get up and running with your own Raspberry Pi and how I'm using mine as a low power, always on BitTorrent server. I'm going to show you some more resources that you can use to expand the capabilities of your Pi. But first, if you're looking to get a Raspberry Pi, I have to warn you, you might have a little trouble finding one. Apparently, there was a recent shipment of new Raspberry Pis, uh, especially the $25 uh, Model A, and it's sold out right away. There seems to be a few of the $35 Model Bs available, and I would suggest the Model B over the Model A anyway, uh, since it has twice the memory and two USB ports instead of one. When I checked the website of www.newark.com, one of the official resellers of the Raspberry Pi in the US, they had 20 units in stock. You can also get a Pi from unofficial resellers on Amazon, but they might be as expensive as $45. Still, not too expensive considering what you get. So I'm gonna assume that you have your Pi hardware all ready to go and that you're ready to install the operating system. Fortunately, this is really pretty easy. Uh, but you do need to use another computer in order to get it started. The Raspberry Pi Foundation recommends something called Raspbian Wheezy. I know that sounds like a weird name, uh, but that's the name of the um, beginner's version of the operating system for Raspberry Pi. It's a version of Debian Linux and it's optimized specifically to work for your Pi. It includes a graphical user interface, a web browser, uh, some other time-wasting programs, um, and Python. Uh, there's lots of other programs you can down to go with it, download to go with it, uh, and when you're ready to get started, head to www.raspberrypi.org slash downloads. Raspy and Wheezy can be downloaded directly, or if you have BitTorrent, you can download it probably a little bit quicker via BitTorrent. The file is 471 megs, so it's reasonably large, and it took me about 10 minutes. If you're using Windows, you're also going to need to use a program called Win32 Disk Imager to write the Raspy and Wheezy image to an SD card. Once you've downloaded both of those files, I suggest you copy them into the same directory and extract the zip file. That way you'll have all the files in one directory. Now, Something that I haven't mentioned until now is that you need to have some sort of a SD card reader slash writer in order to put the data on the card. I have a simple USB uh, card reader. You just plug in the USB card into the slot and plug the device into the nearest USB port and you're ready to go. 
Now, go ahead and mount the SD card, and when you run the Win32 Disk Imager program, it'll allow you to choose and locate the image file and pick the drive letter of the SD card. In my case, the SD card is mounted as drive H, and when you're ready to go, just hit the right button to start copying the image to the SD card. This process takes a few minutes, and when you're done, you're ready to start your Raspberry Pi for the first time. So put the SD card into the Pi, and if all goes well, your Raspberry Pi should boot up, and you'll be presented with the Pi configuration screen. Uh, the configuration screen pops up the very first time you boot your Raspberry Pi, but it won't pop up after that. There are a few options on the configuration screen, including keyboard setup and even some overclocking options. Once you've made your choices, the Pi will boot to the desktop, and this will look very familiar to any of you who are Windows users. There's a start menu of sorts in the lower left-hand corner, and it lets you start a graphical file browser or the built-in web browser. There's also a few nifty time-wasting programs pre-installed on the desktop, and you can have fun messing around with those. And as I mentioned last week, there's also a Raspberry Pi store. And if you visit the store, you can download all sorts of different programs. Some of them are for free, and some of them are paid. Uh, there's games and all sorts of learning programs. Check it out and uh, see what you think. Now, if you feel like you made a mistake when you uh, adjusted your configuration file, you can reopen that configuration program at any time uh, and you type sudo raspy-config and that will open the configuration file back up and you can make changes as much as you like. So what you might want to do is experiment with overclocking a little bit, see if you can get your Pi to run a bit faster. Uh, and if you end up having crashes or instability, then I would recommend that you um, put the clock it's a system clock back the way it was. By the way, one of the most useful options is called expand underscore root FS. Um, this is a good thing to access from the configuration menu um, because the way Raspbian Pi or Raspbian Wheezy is installed, it creates a two gigabyte file system on your little SD card. Uh, now, if your SD card is four gigabytes or eight gigabytes, that means you're not being able to use all of the space that's available. Uh, if you run this configuration option, uh, any remaining space on the um, SD card will be accessible to you, and now you can use the full potential of your SD card. So if you have a four gig SD card, uh, the the file system will increase from two gigs to four gigs and so on. Keep in mind that pre-installed software on uh, the Pi is kept to a minimum. If you had had a bunch of pre-installed software on there, your download of 471 megs would have been much larger. So they leave it up to you to install any extra programs that you might need. Fortunately, Raspbian is linked to the Debian ARM HF repositories, uh, so you have access to more software than you're ever really going to need. Now, if you're new to Linux in general, you may want to install a graphical package manager. Packages are the way that you get software uh, on Linux, uh, and typically there's a simple command line option for doing this, but you can also use a graphical pan package manager like Synaptic. To install it, you type sudo apt-get install synaptic. Uh, do that in a terminal window, and uh, then it can later be opened by going to the LXDE menu, preferences, and then synaptic package manager. Then you can install any software you want. And uh, it's really easy to work with different packages. You can download uh, whatever package, um, you know, strikes your fancy and try it out. And if you don't like it, you can very easily uninstall it as well. Something else that's great about the Raspberry Pi is that since the operating system is on an SD card, and since SD cards are relatively inexpensive, you can buy several different SD cards and try out different operating systems. You can get uh, not just the Raspbian Wheezy, but you can get something called Arch. You can get... Um, 
Chromium OS. I know that Android is in the works. It's not ready yet. Um, there's also a version of Puppy Linux, which we talked about a couple shows ago, and you can get that for the Raspberry Pi as well. Uh, and if you make a separate SD card for each of these operating systems, you can experiment with all of them and see what you like the best. It's a really great way of experimenting with all these different things and finding out what works for you. Now, before I go, I want to direct you to a couple of other great resources. The first one is called Adafruit, and its uh, web address is learn.adafruit.com. Now, it may seem a bit intimidating at first, but Adafruit has a ton of great resources for makers. There are how-to articles on everything from Raspberry Pi to Arduino to do-it-yourself wearable computing projects. Also, check out www.makershed.com. Here you can find kits, electronics projects, and how-tos for Raspberry Pi, and a whole range of Arduino-based projects. Now, that's it for this week. I hope you've enjoyed the show. I haven't figured out exactly what I'm going to do next week. I may show you some tips and tricks for dealing with Android, or I might show you some more Raspberry Pi stuff. Who knows? But I hope you'll tune in and see for yourself. And remember, if you have questions or problems and you need answers, send me an email at wetalknerdy.tv at gmail.com. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next Monday. This is Chesmeister.